Hear now a reading from the prophet Jeremiah, where we will be reading from the 29th chapter, starting with verse 1, moving to verse 4, and then we will actually continue to verse 14. And as I read these words, I invite you to listen for a good word from the Lord. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles, and to the priests, the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, said the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with a hope. Then, when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. They say that you should always tell the truth. It's probably good words to live by. I mean, after all, nobody really likes to be lied to. You might think that you're just coating it a little bit with a little bit of sugar and not wanting to give some bad news. But once the even little white lie that you've told is revealed to be just that, the truth seems to hurt even more. It seems like the person who was lied to feels betrayed and duped and untrusted in some way. So you should always tell the truth. They also say that you should always tell the truth in love. That is to say, if you have a hard truth that you have to deliver, don't ever take pleasure in someone else's pain. Don't ever find joy when you have to give someone bad news, even if it means that you were right and they were wrong. seems that Jeremiah had a harsh, difficult truth that he needed to deliver to the people of Israel. They had been living comfortably in the promised land, in the city of Jerusalem. They had been worshiping and going about life, but they had gone astray. And so, according to the Old Testament, God allowed for the Babylonians to come in in 598 B.C., and by 597, they had conquered everything. They had taken over. They had taken over the temple. They had looted it. They had ransacked the city of Jerusalem. And slowly, they were taking the people of Israel and driving them out into Babylonian captivity dispersing them among all the other people. It was a very difficult time for the people of Israel, as anyone would imagine. They were strangers in a strange land at that point. They'd been taken captive. They were among people that they didn't know, and they were among customs that they didn't know, among uh, food and rituals that were foreign to them. Now, not all of them were taken just yet. Some were still remaining in Jerusalem, Jeremiah, Jeremiah among them. And apparently there were some among the people in captivity and some even perhaps in Jerusalem who were offering a bit of hope. Now perhaps they just wanted to give the people something to believe in, wanted to help them understand that hope is never truly lost. Or maybe they just didn't like the idea of how bad and harsh the news could actually be. Or worse, maybe they were trying to give some bad news and some good news coded in a certain way so that people would start to believe them and they could gain power by gaining the people's trust. 
See, what they were telling the Israelites was that it was only going to take two years. That's all this punishment would last. Just two years. And God would bring the people back home. Their country, their customs, their families would all be restored. It would just take two years. Just suffer in captivity for two years and everything will be okay. But that wasn't the word that Jeremiah had received. He knew that this captivity, this punishment, if that was what it was from God, was going to last far longer than that. He had received a word that the punishment was going to last a full 70 years. At least one generation would be born in the time that they would be in captivity. This was going to be a punishment for the long haul, an extremely difficult time for them. And they needed to get ready. They needed to find ways that they could make the most of it. He wanted them to understand that all hope was not lost, even though they were in this very difficult time, that God was, in fact, still with them, even though it seemed as though they were so distant. That life needed to continue. Life needed to go on. They needed to continue to seek God's blessings and understand God's blessing in their lives, even if it looked far different. They needed to look to the blessings of the everyday. They needed to recognize the blessings that can come from doing work in strange places, among strange people, even when they are, in fact, your enemies. In the midst of all of it, God's blessings can, can flourish among the people, and the people can be drawn back to where they need to be. It shouldn't have been a new message, necessarily, but maybe they just needed to hear it in a new way. After all, they thought that all of the favor that they had had from God had been stripped from them. They thought that they had known where God was going to be. God was in Jerusalem, and all you had to do was go and worship in the temple, and there the very presence of God could be found. But now they weren't there. Was God still with them, working among them? They simply needed to remember their own history. After all, it was on the other side of the Jordan before the people had gone into the promised land where Moses had told them that even though he was not going to go with them and lead them, that God's Spirit was going before them and preparing a way. And if they would just trust that God was there, if they would just seek God, God would be found. And even the prophet Isaiah told them that they didn't need to fear, for God was with them. They did not need to be afraid. Because God was their God wherever they were. It wasn't that God was held within one place, but that God was ruler of all nations and all people and all places. And if they would but seek God, God would be found. And so Jeremiah told them that God still had a purpose. Even though this would be a hard and troubling time, God was still going to work for good among them. God still had a purpose for them that could be used even as they stayed in the midst of captivity. Why is it that when we are going through life's most troubling times, that one of the hardest things to remain faithful is to remind ourselves that God is with us even there? wherever we are, whatever trial we happen to be going through. And yet, Scripture tells us time and time again that there is no place we could possibly go where God will not be with us, where God will not find us, where God will not give us grace and hope and mercy and a future. After all, I'm reminded of that time when Jesus was preparing to leave his disciples back among the world, and he knew it was going to be very difficult for them, not just in the midst of the crucifixion, but as they tried to take on his ministry for themselves when he was not there. And he said, I'm not going to leave you orphaned. I'm not going to leave you abandoned. I'm not going to leave you as if you have no hope, as if you have no future, as if you have no one who will give you the resources that you need. But I'm going to send my spirit to be with you wherever you are, that you will have a comforter, an advocate, someone to stand in between you and God on your behalf, someone to empower you to do the work of the kingdom wherever you are and know that you can have exactly what you need no matter how difficult life may be. And so Jeremiah tells the people, you have to know what to be grateful for. And sometimes it's the simplest things. 
that in the midst of trial, you take comfort in the fact that that little garden that you have planted brings up fruit and flowers and vegetables, and it is beautiful. That even in the hardest times, you find comfort in the people who are around you. So he tells them to enjoy the regular celebrations of life. He says, take wives, take husbands, have children, find joy, prepare the future for the next generation, not just for you, but for the ones who are going to come after you, and then give them in marriage as well. And when the grandchildren come along, then you're really going to know what joy truly is, no matter how difficult life may seem. It's interesting that it's those relationships that so often sustain us. Those people who serve as the presence of God when we most desperately need it. It's when we feel depressed and we get the message or the phone call from someone just saying, I know you've had a really hard time. I'm just checking in. It's when we're sick and someone comes and prays with us at our hospital bed or simply sits and says nothing, but their presence says everything. It's when we are in the midst of that relationship loss, whatever that loss looks like. And there's someone there who's a shoulder to cry on, an ear to complain to. Someone will hear your lament, your confession, whatever it is. There is a presence there to remind you that you are never alone. But even when the physical presence isn't there, we are promised that the spiritual presence certainly is binding us with other fellow believers, binding us to this community of faith that helps us remember we are never alone in this and whatever that dark valley that we are going through is, God is with us in the midst of it and in fact is leading us through it into a better and brighter future and day. Those relationships are important. They'll get you through a lot. I was on my way to Columbia this past Thursday for a meeting with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship of South Carolina And I did what it seems most of my generation does when you're on a long drive with very little else to do. And you you listen to a podcast, right? So I was listening to the TED Radio Hour produced by NPR. It's one of my favorite. I love TED Talks anyway. I think they're great. I I think there's a lot of innovative ideas and thinkers that are out there that we, we need to hear from. And I love the way that the TED Radio Hour will pull them all together common themes and understanding of the world and life. And this particular one was about our needs. They were going through Maslow's hierarchy. Yes, they started with the basic need of food and clothing and shelter and all those things, but they worked their way up. Talked about the need for belonging, the need for a sense that you are part of a tribe, a a community. And in particular, there was one journalist who was following a group of soldiers in Afghanistan. He said, to most of us who have never been in combat, it would be the craziest thing, but these men and women, they become addicted to, to combat and part of it is just the physical nature of the adrenaline rush that you get when you're shot at and you just there's nothing like it but on the other hand you never feel closer to a group of people than you know that the one next to you will give you their life for you and you will give your life for them most of us only get a taste of what that's like Most of us, as we go through the comfort of our daily lives, it's not until we come into a a time of crisis when everything is going wrong and it feels like the world is crumbling down around us. Only then do we have some sense of a community that gets pulled together. And yet we need it so desperately. We need it beyond those times when we're going through crisis. We need it beyond the times of natural disaster. We need it beyond the times when we feel like we're in exile and as if we are a refugee wherever we are and certainly beyond the times of of combat and battle. We need that sense of community to help us remind ourselves that it's God that lifts that community up and binds us and helps us have a sense of who we are because of the belonging that we have. We are here today because we are part of this community of faith. Even if we are here for the first time, we're part of a larger family, a cloud of witnesses who bears witness to Christ and to one another by saying that we are together in good times and bad. And that even when it feels like we are in exile, that there is a community on which we can depend. And so even when life is its most difficult, there is something to be grateful for 
I'm most amazed that it's actually in those times of crisis when I have seen people's true faith. And I have been so inspired that when people have gone through crisis that they find ways to sing God's praises even in the midst of it. They recognize how bad their health is or how bad the financial state is or that the family is falling apart and yet they cling to the promise that God is somehow with them in it. And God can do something through it. Maybe God can teach a lesson of faith, but if nothing else, as we stay true to our own faith in the midst of those times of exile and crisis, God can work through us so that the faith that we proclaim can be seen by others, can be used by others. Psalm 137 is a psalm of lament. Probably pulled together in a time like this, a time of exile, a time of crisis, and it cries out to God asking, how can we sing the praises of the Lord, the songs of the Lord in the midst of a foreign and strange land? And it seems as though that's when you need to sing them most. That when it feels like all is going wrong, sing the praises of God to remind you that God is there Sing the praises of God to have hope when nothing else will give it to you. Sing the praises of God because you've got to fake it till you make it. Sing the praises of God because that's how you turn the desert of whatever you are going through into the oasis that you need to be a part of. Sing the praises of God, Jeremiah tells them. Worship Teach the lessons of the faith. Hold true to them no matter what because if you seek God through them, God will in fact be found. And he says, yes, you are in a foreign place. You are in a foreign land. But make it your home. Make it the place where you live. And I think every one of us, if it's going to be the place where we live, whatever it is, then we need to make that situation better than the way we found it. So Jeremiah tells them, I know you're among the enemies. You're among the captors. They've ruined everything for you. And I know what Psalm 137 says as well as it gets towards the end. The prayer of lament gets so bad that it cries out that God would at last bring retribution among the Babylonians, so much so that it says that they long for a day when the little one's heads would be bashed against the rock. Does that sound of God to you? We have a Savior who told us that we have to pray for our enemies. and Do good to those who persecute you. And love those who hate you. And it's in the midst of this foreign land of captivity that Jeremiah tells the people, work for the good of those who have done wrong to you. Because as you build up that area, they will be drawn towards your faith and they will be drawn towards God. I'm having the honor of going through the Leadership Greenville program right now through the Chamber of Commerce. And as is often the case in any one of those leadership programs, you're divvied up into groups and you work on a group project that will eventually benefit the community in some way. And our group has the opportunity to work with the students and teachers and principal of Tanglewood Middle School. Tanglewood is a community that's struggling, frankly. I think I've read that the average income for the average household is somewhere between fifteen and $20,000 a year. Nearly 100% of the students in that middle school are qualifying for free and reduced lunch. That's so often what we go to when we try to talk about an impoverished area. But the hope that is coming out of that place, the creativity, the energy that is coming out is phenomenally inspiring. Their principal is Dr. Anderson, and he was talking with us at one point. He was sharing with us about a 10th grader who had come back. And they asked him, well, you've, you've moved on. You're getting ready to prepare for college. What, what are you looking to do? What do you want to do? Most of us would think he's going to get his degree and he's getting out of there. He said, no, I'm going to study economics and real estate and law. And when I get my degrees, I'm coming back and I'm investing in this community. 
and I'm going to lift up the assets that are already within it. We're going to build it from the ground up, and it's going to look far better than anyone could possibly imagine right now. These trailers and these small houses and the dealerships that line Whitehorse Road, that's not what you're going to find. You're going to find a community that is thriving. And this is a 10th grader. It may not be coming from a faith perspective, but I see something in that one statement, that one vision for the future that Jeremiah was trying to instill within the people of Israel. You can't run from it sometimes. Build it up from wherever you are. Work for good for yourself and for the people. And it will all be better. Life is never perfect as much as we would want to make it look that way on our social media posts. Life is never perfect. It never will be. We will all find ourselves in times of trouble and trial at different points in our lives. Most of us may feel like we're in exile, but we're not going to be in exile like these Israelites were. But the advice for us whenever we feel that way, whenever we feel oppressed, whenever we feel under pressure, is exactly the same. Seek God in whatever it is. Seek abundant life wherever you are because it can and will be found. Seek God and you will find him. This past Tuesday, we buried one of our oldest saints, Ellen League. Many of you knew her. You knew her faith, the service she provided to this congregation and the Greenville Baptist Association and pretty much anybody who knew her. All of the scriptures we read in that service were hand-picked by Ellen. Every one of them had a theme of God's provision and strength, even in the midst of unbelievable trial. There was one that I didn't read, but that we printed on the inside cover of her order of worship. I shared it this past Wednesday with the group that had gathered for Bible study. It's a contemporary rendering of the Lord's Prayer. It says this, the Lord is my strength. I shall not panic. He helps me relax and rest in quiet trust. He reminds me that I belong to Him and restores my serenity. He leads me in my decisions and gives me calmness of mind. His presence is peace. Even though I walk through the valley of the fear of failure, I will not worry for he will be with me. His truth, grace, and loving kindness will stabilize me. He prepares release and renewal in the midst of my stress. He anoints my mind with wisdom. My cup overflows with fresh energy. Surely goodness and mercy will be communicated through me. For I shall walk in the strength of my Lord and dwell in his presence forever. Wherever we are, whatever we are going through, abundant life can and will be found if we remember the God who comes to us in this way. Amen.